For more on what we are learning about the coronavirus today, let us be joined by emergency care physician, Dr. Ron Elfenbein. Uh, so, Doctor, a new study uh, suggests that recent Black Lives Matter protesters uh, have not led, or the protests themselves have not led to a spike in new cases, but we just heard that we are seeing in a spike uh, in states that reopened earlier. Uh, so why is that? Well, first of all, good morning, and congratulations on going international. That's really exciting for you guys. That's great. Um, so yes, I think you're referencing a study by the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research that was just recently published. Uh, it's actually very fascinating. They, they looked at people's cell phone data to track them, and they realized that while people attending the protests might actually be more likely to get the virus, uh, uh, overall, it led to a decrease in the, in the incidence of viral spread in those particular areas. And the theory is that and, and the, it's not the theory is that it was because people who didn't attend the protests tended to social distance more. And they know this because of looking at cell phone data of the people in those counties in those areas. So a lot of people who didn't attend the protests tended to stay home and tended to not go out and be worried because of traffic, you know, traffic, increased risk of, of uh, violence, police presence, those types of things. So people tended to not go out as much. And it actually did not lead to an increase overall in the incidence of coronavirus, which is a really interesting and uh, interesting revelation, something most people did not think was going to happen. Yeah, that's really fascinating because I just think about, you know, what happened in Philadelphia is that, um, you know, a lot of the streets were shut down anyway. So there really wasn't any place to go. And when I think about right. those days, yeah, a lot of us just sort of ended up, you know, sitting on our front porch, waiting it out. So that's um, that's fascinating. Um, I want to talk about something that Anthony, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci said. He said the likelihood of the U.S. reading, uh, meeting any sort of like herd immunity uh, situation is pretty low if people avoid the vaccine if they don't trust the vaccine and they don't get it. Can we talk a little bit more about, about the impact of people just simply refusing to take the vaccine once we get one? Yes. You know, unfortunately, there's a lot of distrust with vaccines. And, you know, there's this the debunked study that, you know, uh, vaccines led to autism that has been debunked time and time and time and time again. Despite, But despite the fact, people still believe that vaccines can lead to increase in autism and and bad things, D really, despite the fact that v vaccines have saved more people than anything in the history of humanity. Vaccines are the number one thing that have saved more people's lives than anything you can point your finger at. Um, but yes, D Fauci was talking, Dr. Fauci was talking about uh, a recent study that showed that roughly a third of Americans will, will say in a poll that they will refuse to get any vaccine that the government says will help uh, control coronavirus, which is very disappointing. Um, and I think that the government needs to do a better job of trying to sell that by getting, you know, uh, uh, actors and, and uh, 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 professional athletes and people like that to try to get the average Joe to say, you know what, I'll get this vaccine if they're going to get the vaccine. You know, th there, there are unfortunately very, very few precedents of bad outcomes with vaccines. And those have been really a long time ago. And the technology has really changed. But back in the 50s, there was something called the Cutter Incident with a polio vaccine that actually caused 250 people to get polio, and they, some of them became paralyzed from it. And then in the um, in the 80s, there was a uh, H1N1 vaccine for uh, bird flu that um, that led to some potential increase, never been proven, of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a neurologic syndrome that that has been quote unquote tied to some virus uh, to some vaccines. Uh, but the data is really spurious on that. And actually, even if there was any any tie to it, it increased your risk to one in a hundred thousand people that got this 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 problem called Guillain-Barre. So it's really not even known that it really caused it or had a correlation with it uh, or causation rather. So you know, that people really have to be educated that if there is a vaccine, it will really help people and help us achieve that herd immunity, which is our goal. Because if you think about what herd immunity really means, is it's like dominoes. If you set up a bunch of dominoes, and in between every third domino, you put a brick and you knock the dominoes over, they're not going to go anywhere. That's the same thing with herd immunity. The idea is that enough people will have, the have antibodies to the virus that, you know, you might get it, but you're not going to spread it to 10 people because everybody around you has antibodies to it. So that's kind of how herd immunity works. Um, and we really need to get there to stop the spread of this thing. 
Uh, uh, Dr. Offenbein, uh, Anthony Fauci also mentioned that the Trump administration is eyeing a new testing strategy for coronavirus. Yeah. What are you learning about that? So that's another really fascinating idea. It's called pool testing. And the idea with that is, if let's say you have 100 people that you want to get tested. Let's say you have 20 people you want to get tested. So instead of testing each one of those people individually, you take one test and you run one test with 20 people. So you swab 20 people and then you run one single test. The idea is that if you're short on tests, you can identify a large population and kind of narrow it down to who has the virus. Now, this will, this idea will most likely work in the United States because most people are not infected with the coronavirus. If you have a large population of people who have it, it's not going to work. But if you had, as I was saying before, let's say you have 100 people, you split them up into groups of 20, you really only then need five tests to narrow it down to see, well, how many of those people, which groups have it, and let's say one, one of those tests positive. So then you test each individual member of that one group. So basically, you've used 26 tests to test 100 people. So the idea is that you can really do very large population controls and very large population samples using very, very few number of tests. Um, you know, public health experts all agree, basically, wearing a mask is one of the best ways to stop the spread of the virus. But I, I don't know if people are sort of undergoing mask fatigue or what it is, but I, I'm seeing, you know, fewer and fewer people wearing them as religiously as they were before. Or they got them on their face, but they're like hanging underneath their chin. And now, you know, we just saw these uh, mask exempt cards that are going around that the Justice Department had to come out and say, it, you know, this is not legit. There is no such thing as a, 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 a card that exempts you from wearing a mask indoors. If a, if a business says you have to wear a mask indoors, then, you know, that's it. Absolutely. But there are people who are concerned. It's not just about, you know, my rights. And we've heard the people sort of talking about it's their right not to or, or, or whatever. But some people have really um, have real concerns about whether or not there are health implications if you're wearing a mask all the time, particularly people who may already have breathing issues. So can we just sort of clarify what the science says? Are, wearing a mask a lot, is that dangerous for you? What if you already have a breathing issue? Maybe you have asthma. Is wearing a mask an issue? Well, I would say if you have bad asthma, you should really stay home. It shouldn't be going out. And if you have bad asthma, uh, you're the one that's likely, if you catch it, to die from it. So you're the one that really should be wearing a mask. Um, you know, I, I wear mine religiously. I just got off of a 24-hour shift working in the emergency room, and I, I wear a mask every time I go out of my little call room um, just because I, I'm, I need to. These, these fraudulent uh, cards you're talking about are actually interesting. I, I just Googled it before coming on, and you can buy a box of them for $50 on the Internet. Um, it's completely fraudulent. There's no data behind it, and there's no science behind it. Um, the only people that I really could consider not necessarily needing a mask or not necessarily, you know, shouldn't be wearing a mask are people who have really bad allergies to the polypropylene that's in the mask. And if you touch it to your face and you wear it for a long period of time, it can cause irritation. But they make cloth masks. They make cotton masks. You can find a product that will, will fit your needs and won't irritate your face. Uh, people who have really, really bad asthma or COPD, if wearing a mask makes you that uncomfortable, you really should just stay home because your risk of catching the virus and dying from it is astronomically high. So if, if the fact that you put mm -hmm. this over your face it makes it that uncomfortable and difficult for you to breathe, you really shouldn't even be going outside. Uh, uh, it's such it, good advice, Doc. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it advice. probably, it's hard because you are uh, up against, for example, the president of the United States, the vice president of the United States, who are asked repeatedly, you know, uh, your own coronavirus task force recommends wearing masks. The vice president says, well, people should listen to their local officials. So then somebody, a reporter, Paula Reed, says, well, in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, they told you, uh, here's what local officials are recommending, and then you still defied local officials. So it's hard for people to take uh, what they're hearing from health officials, from people like yourself, Dr. Elfenbein, if the message from the very highest levels of our government are so mixed. I will point out, uh, I mentioned last week, Anne-Marie and Dr. Elfenbein, that I found some historical um, uh, documents showing people protesting the wearing of masks during the 1919-1918 yep. influenza epidemic. Recently, I also found uh, some interesting editorials going back to when seatbelts first became law of the land. People yeah. wrote editorials saying, seatbelts are infringing on my personal freedom. <laughs> seatbelts are anti-freedom. So it sounds to me like we're always going to be up against this when it comes to people in this country. <laughs> um, helmets, too. It's really fascinating right? to me. 
Most and helmets. helmets exactly yeah. right. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the stuff We're that American. is good for you, people resist. That's right. We're American. <laughs> Indeed. Don't don't <laughs> tread on me. Uh, Dr. Right. Elfenbein, thank <laughs> yeah. you as always, sir. We appreciate it. <laughs> Good week and stay safe. Uh, so Dr. Elfenbein also just released a book on uh, a way to answer all of your coronavirus related questions. It's called Surviving Coronavirus, an ER Doc's Perspective, and it's free through all reader platforms except Kindle. All right, what a brilliant idea and perfect timing for that. And it's an ebook, so you can get it immediately. Hey, we also want to remind you a little bit of a programming note. Uh, tomorrow, the Senate Health Committee will be holding a hearing on how to safely get back to work and school. I mean, I. It's funny that we're talking about getting back to work and school and doing it safely as Senate is having this hearing because I feel like people have already started to kind of do stuff like that. They've already, you know, some people are already going back to work. Businesses are already open. It seems like we're a little late on this. Camps are already talking about opening. But anyhow, 